Ben Salango. You may remember Ben from a couple of different scenarios over the last several years. One, of course, was uh, you might remember the special needs situation that has resulted in a long and ongoing uh, uh, lawsuit and court situation here out of the eastern panhandle and also as a candidate for governor in West Virginia in the last election. Ben, good morning. Thanks so much for being with us today. Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Hey, by the way, is your involvement in that special needs situation in, out of the eastern panhandle uh, concluded, or is that still ongoing from your end? My, my formal involvement has uh, obviously concluded, but uh, I'm still watching it. I mean, the criminal case is still going on, and uh, I saw recently that Judge Faircloth had rejected a plea deal, and it's going to go to trial. So uh, I'm anxious to find out the outcome of that trial. You know, Judge Faircloth has been – uh, she handled the civil case as well, and, and she is an is excellent judge, just an outstanding judge. The people of the Eastern Panhandle are lucky to have her. Yes, I uh, used to do, uh, back in the 90s, uh, segments with her on uh, the law and all sorts of different uh, exploratory aspects of learning more about the law and the program with her. Ben, do you have any idea why Judge Faircloth rejected the plea agreement? You know what, I think judges... Uh, Judges have a, an obligation to review the plea and to make sure that it's uh, fair and that it's in the best interest of justice, and she didn't think it was. Uh, and you know what? It takes a lot for a judge to do that. It really does. It, and Judge Faircloth uh, has been you know, just a great judge, both on the, on the civil and the criminal side, throughout this. I've had a few cases with her over the years, and you know, she's always prepared. She's incredibly smart. Uh, she rules. You know, sometimes you go in front of a judge and you argue a, a motion or some issue. You won't get a ruling for six months to a year, which kind of drags the case out. She doesn't do that. She rules. I mean, she's very good. Very, very good. So uh, I'm anxious to see the outcome of that trial. I'll obviously be following it from Charleston. Yeah. One other thing on the plea agreement, and I understand uh, that the judge has to make the decision is a fair plea agreement. Uh our prosecuting attorney is a lady that's uh, Katie Delgatti, uh, who's mm -hmm. held in phenomenal regard. And so most of the agreements that she makes, uh, a lot of us would like to assume that they are fair, they are very uh, uh, objective in the way they're treated. But evidently in this particular case, uh, the judge did not feel the prosecuting attorney had, had met those standards. Would that be fair to say? Well, I think that's probably fair to say. I think really you, you've got to look at it from also the public perspective. When you are when you have such a high-profile case and you want to make sure that the public uh, doesn't lose faith in the judicial system. Now, the prosecutor's role is very, very different than the judge's role. The prosecutor has to look at what are all the legal issues in the case. If the judge rules on a certain issue, is that going to affect my ability to get a conviction? The judge looks at it as – is this a fair and equitable plea? Is it a fair and equitable resolution? Will it cast you know, doubt on the judiciary or the judicial system as a whole? And you know, so they're, they're looking at it from a couple of different perspectives. Ultimately, you know, I applaud Judge Faircloth. It's very rare. It is very rare for a judge to reject a plea agreement. Um, so I'm glad, quite frankly, that this case is going to go to trial. I'm glad that a jury of, uh, uh, of their peers is going to review this and – um, I have high hopes for a, a very favorable outcome. How were you initially involved in that situation, Ben, in regards to day one, how a guy that's not from the Eastern Panhandle ends up handling a case like that? You know what? I'd handled a few other cases uh, involving special needs children in the Eastern Panhandle, obviously not as high profile, but one of my former clients recommended me. So it, the, the issue had been going on for a month or two before I ever got involved. In fact, uh, I think the initial report of when the mom, you know, actually Pack hid the uh, Amber Pack hid the microphone in the girl's hair, it had gotten tens of millions of views online. And and honestly, I had not heard anything about it until I was contacted. It was probably a month, month and a half after it occurred that I was contacted. And when I heard the facts, I was just I was furious, absolutely furious. And that's why I got involved. Uh, ben, I realize. And, 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 I'm sorry. You know, me, if sorry. you look at this case also, mm -hmm. what the mom did, uh, and and we've got some, we, you know, Patricia Rucker and uh, Charlie Trump and others in the legislature uh, have really taken taken significant steps to protect special needs children. 
and I'm, I'm a different party, uh, but I applaud them as well. Mm-hmm. You know, they have really uh, moved the ball forward for special needs kids. In fact, we're one of the few states in the country that has cameras in self-contained classrooms now, which has captured other abuse, some other very high-profile cases. Uh, other states are looking at what West Virginia has done in that regard, including uh, Maryland. Uh, most recently, I was asked to, to speak in the Maryland legislature about cameras in the classrooms and protecting special needs children. You know, they've done a wonderful job, and now it's a felony. Uh, in fact, when, when the PAC case started, you could get more time in prison for abusing an animal than you would a special needs child, which was, which was appalling. And so the legislature – uh, change that law. It's now a felony to abuse either verbally or physically a special needs child. And now we have cameras in the classrooms to give these kids some protection. Wow. I was not aware of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ben, before we get into what the reason, main reason you own today, uh, Kent Carper, the, uh, uh, the uh, president of Canal County County Commission uh, has had some problems recently, both health problems and I think also some potential legal problems. Would you address on how uh, Kent is doing? You know, Kent is home now. He had, a, I believe it was a quadruple bypass. Uh, he's also had, he had a stroke, uh, some many strokes, I believe. And he's home. He's in recovery. Uh, you know, that is a, that's a major operation. They, you know, they cut your sternum open. They have to wire it shut. It, it takes a long time to recover from that operation. And so he is still not back uh, with the county commission. Uh, so he's home recovering. You know, I'm, I'm wishing Kent all the best. He's He's been a dear friend of mine for a long time, and uh, I was, quite frankly, shocked when I heard that, um, that you know, what the allegation was. And Kent still has not personally spoken to it, but uh, I'm anxious to uh, for Kent to talk about it when he's able. Ben, let's talk about potential uh, uh, race for governor. You've uh, You've run the race before. And uh, you're weighing a decision as to whether you should do it again. What's going to go into the final calculation as to which side you come down on this one? You know what? When when I got into the 2020 race, and I was the last Democrat in, uh, you know, there, there were a lot of people getting in at that time. But um, uh, Stephen Smith had been out for a year, uh, almost a year and a half before I got involved in the race. And uh, Ron Stallings and a couple others had announced I didn't get into the race until October of 2019, which is by all standards, uh, fairly late. At that time, when I when I pulled it before I got into the race, you know, Jim Justice was uh, the most unpopular governor in America at that point. And when the race started and then COVID happened, he went from the most unpopular to the most popular. And so that, that was, um, it was an uphill battle, uh, particularly with COVID. And quite frankly, most of the things he did, I thought were, were very good. Uh, I think he's been a very good governor. You know, he's he's led the state through uh, a lot of a lot of issues, including the worst health pandemic that we've seen in our lifetimes. Hopefully, hopefully that we'll ever see in our lifetimes. And so, I, you know, it was an uphill battle. I knew that from the beginning. But when we polled it, uh, even a generic Democrat uh, could come in within six points of him at that point. And so that's when I got into the race. Obviously, you know, the way that things played out didn't work out that way, but. Uh, I enjoyed it. I had a great time. I had, you know, a lot of fun on the campaign trail. Uh, I think that um, giving it another run in 2024, if I elect to do that, I think we'll have a different outcome. But we'll see. You know, I'm I'm right now focused on making sure that everything's going okay in Kanawha County, particularly with the absence of uh, Commission President Carper. And then I'll make a decision probably in August or September. But, you know, I have uh, I enjoyed that race. I had a blast, quite frankly. Uh, I wouldn't mind giving it another run, but I haven't. I haven't uh, confirmed that. Now, if you ask my wife, <laughs> she, she's probably going to say, "What in the world are you thinking?" Uh, because it is a significant time commitment. It's a significant financial commitment. It's a family commitment, quite frankly. And so, I'll talk to the boys. I'll talk to Tara, and uh, we'll we'll announce something in probably August or September. Ben, picking up on the financial side, uh, this is uh, West Virginia has really uh, has gone bright red, and it's no yeah. surprise. Uh, w- does a Democrat have difficulty raising sufficient money to do a viable race for statewide office? 
You know what? I think if you look back to 2020, and, and I haven't looked at these numbers in quite some time, but I think I put in around around 700000 uh, into the race, and then I raised about $1.5 million-ish, maybe, maybe closer to two in that range, and then we burned down to zero. I mean, it was, you know, it was an expensive race. Um, it is more difficult for Democrats to raise money in West Virginia. Uh, so you you have to have somebody that can put in a little bit of money on their own. You know, you need to, be, need to have somebody that can self finance. Those uh, campaign ads are not free, and you know you're going to have to probably go up against uh, several political action committees. Some that have already committed at least uh, ten million dollars to one candidate. Uh, there will be more, you know, more significant political action committee uh, money as well. So yeah, those are all things you have to decide. You know, the the last thing you want to do is uh, spend significant amounts of your own money and then, you know, uh, hit your friends up for money and then come out on the losing side. So, you know, I'm looking at all of those issues about uh, will we be able to raise significant money uh, to be able to finance the campaign? And, you know, what's the outcome? What will the outcome be? I, I think I would do very well in the Democratic primary. I think I would, um, uh, you know, getting in late, but now that I have, uh, you know, statewide name recognition that is uh, substantially higher than where it was when I started, I tell you, if you ever, if you ever want a humbling experience, do a uh, do your very first statewide name recognition poll. And when I did that in 2019, it came back at 13 percent, and that was all, almost all Kanawha County and, and Raleigh County where I grew up. And so I didn't have any name recognition outside of those two counties, but now it's around 80 percent. Uh, so I've got a little bit of an advantage coming in, uh, particularly over the other Democratic uh, opponents if, um, if I decide to run. Uh, some of the Republicans, particularly Patrick Morsey, has significant state uh, name identification. You know, he's probably in the 90 to 95 percent range, I would imagine. Uh, and so those things all factor into, you know, whether, whether I'm going to run. It, those things factor into whether anyone should run, quite frankly, because – You've got to be able to either get out there and work, you know, every single day some type of grassroots campaign, which Stephen Smith uh, tried to run without, you know, having a lot of money to put on TV, and then uh, or you've got to be able to finance it and get your state name ID up that way. So one or the other. So, you know, what we did was we were on the road every single day. Uh, at that time, you know, even after COVID, we were still trying to get out as much as we could. Uh, but we were doing a lot of Zoom calls, a lot of Zoom meetings, uh, a lot of earned media, and then we spent, you know, two plus million dollars uh, TV and radio. Yeah, uh, Ben, I applaud you and other Democrats running. I think it's most healthy for any state to have a, a strong two-party system, but in West Virginia, we don't have that. Uh, you've admitted that uh, the amount of money available it was probably going to be much greater for folks like Marcy uh, than most of the Democrats, uh, and yet, yet you're out on a very, very steep, uphill climb uh, and the probability of winning is is you have to, i think to be honest is fairly remote what prompts someone to do that to knowing the odds is very much against you also the dollars available to support your com uh, your campaign is also very much against you what prompts someone to do that to jump in well you know what i i growing up my dad you know the day after father's day i was thinking about this yesterday my dad passed in 2018 but growing up um no matter what I said to him, you know, if, if there was some big challenge, uh, whether it was something easy like I can't mow that yard or whatever, every time that I would say that I can't, his response to me was can't, never could, can't, never could. Um, that's, the, that's how I grew up. I mean, I grew up from very humble beginnings, uh, and every step along the way, you know, I had doubts about whether I could do it. I had doubts whether I could. You know, I was the first person in my family to ever go to college. I had doubts whether I could do it. I had doubts whether I could go to law school, doubts whether I could, you know, pass the bar exam, doubts whether I could start my own business. Uh, so, you know, you're always faced with these doubts, uh, but you're never going to truly know unless you try. You're never truly going to know unless you step up and take on that challenge. I've never turned away uh, from a challenge. I mean, in 2019, when I announced, keep in mind, I was taking on the richest man in West Virginia, 
uh, with a thir- and I had a 13% name ID. So I knew it was going to be an uphill battle, but, you know, like my dad taught me, and I'm sure like a lot of parents tell their kids, can't never could. So you got to step up, you've got to try. So, you know, a lot of times when, you know, you can get out there and, you know, things can happen. For instance, if you look back at the 1996 race, West Virginia was true blue, right? So you've got um, Joe Manchin running against Charlotte Pritt in the Democratic primary. Charlotte Pritt won. Uh, Yet we voted Republican. You know, we voted Cecil Underwood in that year. Uh, There have been times, even when West Virginia was true blue, that we've elected uh, a Republican governor. In 2016, 20 and 2016, when West Virginia was trending red, West Virginia elected the Democratic governor, Jim Justice, who ultimately switched to the Republican Party. But so I don't think that just because West Virginia is trending one way or the other, that it forecloses anyone else from winning. I think that ultimately most of the people will go in and they will vote for the candidate that they think will do the best job. Uh, you're going to have 15 percent on either end. You know, you've got 15 percent of the Republicans, maybe a little higher, that would never in a million years vote for a Democrat. You've got 15 percent of the Democrats who would never in a million years vote for a Republican. And then you've got everybody else who's going to look at it, study it, and say, this is the best person for the job. This is the person that I'm going to vote for. That's the way I vote. You know, I'm telling you, as the 2020 Democratic uh, nominee, I've voted for Republicans. If I think that they're going to do the right job, that they're going to do the, uh, a better job than the person they're up against, I vote for them. I think that's the way most West Virginians are. Ben Salengo, our guest here. Unfortunately, Ben, in too many cases, there isn't a Democrat on the ballot to vote for. In the general election, we've seen that in House of Delegates races throughout the state in this area here of the Panhandle. I think we had at least two, maybe three uncontested seats in the last election. What is the state of the West Virginia Democratic Party, Ben, from your eagle eye of you in Charleston? I I think it's in a real rebuilding phase. You know, that's kind of my thought. I think they're trying to build a bench. Um and I think they're they're doing all that they can. You know, they're they're trying to get out there and, and recruit new candidates, get people involved, work on grassroots efforts. Um, I think that's what's going on now. You know, if you if you look at uh, most of the cities in in West Virginia, they have Democratic mayors. Um, a lot of the county commissions are Democratic. Uh, Kanawha County has a you know two to one uh, Democratic, but quite frankly, they're it's. It's not really a political position. Uh, I vote with uh, our Republican, Lance Wheeler, as much as I vote with the Democrat, uh, Kent Carper. So, you know, I've said this before, but it, it bears repeating. I don't care if it's a Republican idea or a Democratic idea. I don't care if it's a good idea. Uh, so I think that the Democratic Party is in a rebuilding phase. Uh, it may take a while before we see the, the fruits of that effort, but uh, eventually it will get back to uh, uh, hopefully – We'll get back to a party that's competitive uh, on the ballot at all levels. What do you see as the main issues in the next general election, Ben, for the state of West Virginia? You know, I think that that, that it's going to come down to population loss, infrastructure, uh, and the economy. Uh, the population loss, I cannot overestimate how big of an issue that is because – for every one person that leaves, that's really three or four people uh, down the line, right? So every person that leaves, if you assume they have stayed here, got married, had babies, you know, we're losing significant numbers of people. That also really cuts into our, our revenue base, our tax base. So those people, instead of, you know, living in West Virginia and paying taxes here, they're living in Charlotte and Pittsburgh and uh, D.C. and everywhere else. And we're losing our, our tax base. We're losing uh, our educated population. If people are getting degrees here and then moving out of state, we need them to stay. And so that that is a significant issue in West Virginia. We've seen that now for the last 60 years. No one's really come up with a solution to fix that. Uh, you know, in the 2020 race, I offered a couple of plans that I thought would work. Um, you know, we'll see. We'll see. We're, we continue to lose uh, population at a greater rate than, than any other state. Uh, that has to be fixed. We've got to work on our infrastructure, you know, the, our roads, our bridges, 
uh, we've got to dedicate significant amounts of money and time and effort uh, into those things, even though I think, quite frankly, Jimmy Riston's doing a great job uh, at highways. Uh, every time I have an issue in Kanawha County, I call him, he, he gets it taken care of. But, you know, so we've got to really focus on uh, expanding our infrastructure. We've got to work on different types of, of uh, jobs. It can't always be the same old uh, thing. It can't always be uh, you know, focusing on one industry. We've got to make sure that we're expanding and, and bringing in new technologies and, and things where uh, our high school and college graduates can stay here and work here. So those are the issues, quite frankly, that that uh, if I run, I will be focused on. But that's, that's what everybody has to be focused on. You know, there, there are going to be folks out there that are using the social issues to divide us. Uh, we've got to focus on the issues that bring us together and uh, and really focus on getting West Virginia on the right track. And at some point in August, Ben, you will make your decision as to whether you're going to run or not. Yeah, I would imagine in August I will make the final decision and um, let everybody know. We appreciate your time this morning. Hey, thanks for having me on. Thanks, Ben. Good chat with you. From our you. De Democrats in our chat section, Ben, they're all encouraging you to run, by the way. Oh. <laughs> what are the Republicans saying? <laughs> Some of them are encouraging you to run, too. <laughs> hey, thanks a lot. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Have man. a good day, sir. Yeah.